God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. That video clip, many of you no doubt have seen it. It's been on YouTube and around for a long, long time. But I wanted to use it this morning as we begin our very first session together because there are some truths contained in that that I think are really relevant for us today. And so I want to share a message with you that happens to be the same title of the video clip. And that message is entitled, Are You Ready? Now, let me set the stage about this particular video clip to make sure that we're all on the same page. You hear the voice of astronaut, the Apollo 8 program, Jim Level, as he's talking about and reading scripture uh, while they were in outer space, that very first uh, moonshot. Now, just a parenthetical note, of course, atheist Madeline Murray O'Hare promptly filed a lawsuit accusing them of merging church and state, which obviously later was thrown out. But having said that, we get a real quick glimpse of 6,000 years of man's history. And we know the Bible tells us that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And while I know that there's a lot of uh, confusion about that particular subject today, especially with the religion of uh, evolution that is being perpetrated across our world, the bottom line is the Word of God stands uh, as the only reliable, accurate source of how the world came into existence. But having said that, we get a fast-forward view of 6,000 years <clears throat> of man's history upon the face of the earth. And as you could see from the video clip, in just those snippets, it's been a very turbulent time. You know, God said that when he created the world, that it was good. And then on that sixth day, when he created man, he said it was very good. But by the time you get to Genesis chapter 6 in the Word of God, we find that God is grieved in his heart that he's even created man, for man thinks only to do evil always, God said. And so obviously the flood came, and then in the aftermath of that, God began his work of bringing the world to a point where they would be an encounter, there would be an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. But having said that, we then transition in this video clip to this passionate preacher, and he is with passion preaching the Word of God. And he's doing something that regrettably is not done in a lot of churches today. And that is he's preaching about the soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's challenging those who are listening to him with the reality that it may in fact be this very day. And then all of a sudden, boom, what happens? Well, <clears throat> that depiction is of the coming of Christ for the bride. 
not to be confused with the second coming of Christ when he physically and visibly returns to the earth, but rather when he appears in the heavens, he calls his bride home to us with the trumpet blast of God, the dead in Christ are raised first, we who are alive and remain are caught up in the clouds to be with him as we are taken then to the Father's house. That's the event that is being portrayed in this particular video clip. Now, notice what happened. <clears throat> there were people who were left behind. Not everyone in that, in that congregation was taken up. Now, the sad reality of it is, is that there are people all over the world, and America in particular, who are good people, who go to church, they sing the songs, they may read from the Bible, etc. But in reality, they have yet to come to a saving relationship in Jesus Christ. And the fact is, is that what you saw in the video clip, in my humble opinion, albeit accurate, I wondered if you were going to get that. In my humble opinion, that will be most likely the way it will be because the Word of God itself teaches that. And so because I don't want anybody within the sound of my voice, whether you're present in this room or whether you're with us on the live stream, I don't want a single person to miss heaven and make hell because they've not yet come to understand what it means to be truly, rightly related to God through Jesus Christ the Son. So this morning, I want to talk to you about, are you ready? Because what you saw is going to happen. Paul says it's going to happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. No man knows the day or the hour. We don't know, but I will tell you all of the indicators are that we're getting closer by the moment. In fact, I can say with absolute certainty, we're closer to this moment of the coming of Christ than we have ever been before. Following that event, of course, the world is going to be thrust into that unprecedented, unparalleled time, beginning in Revelation chapter 6 and ending in the 19th chapter, verse 11 and following, when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords comes again. This time, not in the sky to just claim his bride, but rather returning with his bride, clothed in his royal garments with that name written upon his thigh, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and with but a word from his mouth, he slays his enemies. And according to Revelation 20, uh, he has a, there's a river of blood 200 miles long, four and a half feet deep, created just by a word from the mouth of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Those are future events. Those are the things that we know are going to happen based on the Word of God. But I want to focus today on this question. Are you ready? Now, when I looked at the video clip, and of course I was in the process of, uh, of formulating a message that God had put in my heart, and I thought, well, you know, I can use that to kind of introduce this. But here's what I want to do. I want to take the clip, and I want to ask and answer three relevant questions today <clears throat> from the Word of God that I think we need to deal with at this particular juncture in our lives. The first question that I want to ask you today, as soon as I get this thing going, is, is, is it possible to think that you are saved and yet be lost? You say, well now, Gary, wait just a minute. What does this message, this kind of message, what does this have to do with a prophecy conference? Well, I want to tell you that that's a very good question, and I want to answer it this way. It has everything to do with the Prophecy Conference because, see, you can know everything about Bible prophecy. You can be tuned into the latest themes and ideas and thoughts and yet die and go to hell without Jesus. And I can prove that to you from the Word of God because the Bible says it is possible to think that you are saved and yet be lost. How do I know that? Because Jesus said yes to that question. So if you have a Bible this morning, you're taking notes, and I know we, the lights are a little bit dim here, but, but we're going to be talking about Matthew chapter 7, verse 22, and following in this particular message. We'll be employ, uh, you know, using a number of different passages of Scripture, but that's going to be our, our text for this particular moment. Now notice the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. Many, Jesus said, will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. Did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Now, <clears throat> I want to take this verse of Scripture apart. This is something that you've heard. It's a part of the Beatitudes in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. But I want to take this passage of Scripture apart because 
there is, there's, there's truth contained here that we need to be clear about this very day. Jesus begins this statement by saying, many. He didn't say a handful, one or two, or a few. He says, there will be many who will say to me on that day. Now, I want to tell you that this many is contrasted in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, when Jesus said, broad is the road that leads to destruction, and most or many go that way. But few uh, are the ones who go on the narrow road, for the narrow road is the one that leads to eternal life. And he says, few there are that find it. So Jesus himself is contrasting the many with the few that find the true path that leads to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But he says to them, on this day, many will say to me, what day is he talking about? Well, Jesus, because he was fully God, yet fully man, he was looking down the halls of history, down through the corridors of time, to an event that we find in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15, that I'm confident that you're familiar with. It's called the great white throne judgment of God. So Jesus is looking down to that day of judgment, and he's looking at that time when all of lost humanity is going to stand before the throne of God, and the Bible says, and the books of life will be opened. And whoever's name is not found written in the book of life will hear those words, depart from me, you who work iniquity into everlasting fire. In other words, this is the time when God himself judges every person who has rejected to come to know Jesus by grace and through faith, but has chosen rather to attempt to earn their standing before God through their own merit. God says, you have the right to be judged according to your own works. And when that happens, you will be found wanting. And so this is the day he's talking about. Jesus is saying on that day, what will happen? These people will stand before him and they will say, notice it, Lord, Lord. Now, let me just pause for a moment and say that the word Lord, which literally could be translated as boss, but Lord is indicative of, a, of an intimate personal relationship. I mean, you know, my wife, Sandra, who unfortunately couldn't be with us this weekend due to an illness, she, uh, she and I have an intimate personal relationship. We know each other in the biblical sense. And so I can make statements to her like, darling, I can call her honey, I can call her sweetheart. Why? Because it is indicative of the fact that we have this intimate, personal, abiding relationship. Here are people indicating with their own mouths that they really, truly know God that they have this same kind of intimate relationship with him. And yet, notice what God says. Notice what rather they say. They then move from that and say, well, did we not prophesy? And that this is not predictive in the sense of making a prediction, of, but rather it is the proclamation of the word of God. Did we not preach would be a real good translation. Did we not preach in your name? And in your name drive out demons? And in your name perform many miracles? Now I want you to notice something about these people. They're good folks. These are religious people. This is not your, this is not your crowd that, that's down at the bar on Friday night or Saturday night and getting wasted and, and don't care anything about God, not interested in church, don't care about the Bible. That's not who we're talking about here. These are the people who are good people. By the way, notice it. Preaching, casting out demons, performing miracles. Anybody cast out any demons this morning on the way here or... Anybody do any miracles? This is heavy spiritual stuff, is it not? Certainly, do your head like this. This is heavy spiritual stuff. These are good people. But I want you to notice something. Everything they have said has nothing to do with him, and it has everything to do with them. It's all about what they have done in his name. I want you to notice his response to that. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. King James Bible says, depart from me, you who work iniquity. This translation says, away from me, you evildoers. So here are these wonderful, good, warm, kind, loving, religious people who are doing all of these things in the name of Jesus. And Jesus looks at them and says, I don't know you. Get away from me. Depart from me. You have nothing to do with me. Well, I got to tell you, when you really begin to understand this passage, you kind of begin to have a question mark formed in your mind. And that is, if these people who did all of these things, if they don't know for sure that they're saved, is it possible for anyone to know for certain 
that they are saved? Well, the good news is absolutely. Because you see, in 1 John 5, 13, John would write, These things have I written unto you who believe, who trust in, who rely upon, who have confidence in, on the name of the Son of God that you may know. That word know is an experiential word. It means that they have experienced something with regard to him. And the something they've experienced is that they have total, complete confidence a calm assurance that they know that they have eternal life and that they believe upon the name of the Son of God. Now, people say, well, you know, uh, uh, what, what, how do, what, do, what do works have to do with all this thing? I mean, aren't works important? And they are. We'll talk about that in a moment. But here's the thing. We need to absolutely be certain that we know Christ. Why? Well, the Bible tells us in Hebrews 9, 27, that he's appointed a man once to die. And as I look out across this room, as those people who are with us via live streaming, I want you to understand I can tell you about your future. I can tell you that one of two things is going to happen to you. Either, first of all, you're going to step from this life into eternity because you are in the flesh going to die. Or Jesus is going to come, and if you know him, you're going to miss that and be transformed in the air. Having said that, then it becomes imperative. It behooves us to make sure that we know that we know Him. Because you see, the truth of the matter is, is that I don't know where you are. Most of you, I don't know. I don't know what, where you, what your background is. I don't know what you've been taught. I don't know what you've heard. And so it is imperative. God put this in my heart to share this with you because we love the people we love everyone, but we especially love those who have made the sacrifice to come here and be in this particular conference and those who are listening at home. And we want to make sure that you settle this issue once and for all. And there's a reason for that, because until this issue is settled for all of eternity, most and many people today find themselves hanging around the foot of the cross. They're constantly being accused by the enemy. They're not real sure that they're saved. And as a result of that, God can never do through you and my life what he really wants to do until we settle this most important first and foremost issue. So a simple diagnostic test this morning, okay? Now, we were at MD Anderson down in Houston, Texas, week before last, my wife was miraculously cured of uh, inoperable, what they considered inoperable, and they, in their words, not mine, incurable breast cancer. And yet God chose to miraculously heal her. And, uh, but they, we went through a series of tests there to be diagnosed, you know, how that goes. There was the MRIs, the bone scans, and the PET scans, and all those kinds of things. Well, they were all right there at one point, but three months later, they were all gone. You'd be surprised how many people we share that with, and they say, well, they just must have misdiagnosed her at MD Anderson. And I just tell them, they don't misdiagnose anybody at MD Anderson. They don't deal with cancer every now and then. They deal with it all day long, every day. It was an accurate diagnosis, and I will tell you, don't minimize what the healing God can do. Amen? Amen. That said, that said, the diagnostic test can be applied to us spiritually. So I have a three-part, very simple diagnostic test. You answer these things in the privacy of your own heart because it is, at the end of the day, about the relationship between you and the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, question number one, when you're all alone, do you have a desire to be more like Jesus? Now, it's amazing how many people do not understand what one of the primary plans of God is for our lives. Can I just tell you that the will of God for my life and yours is that we would be becoming more like Jesus with each passing day. You see, i got to tell you something. Have you ever met any mean people in churches? I have. I remember, I'll never forget preaching in San Antonio when the lady came down the aisle at the invitation. And she said, oh, Brother Frazier, I just need to confess uh, that I that I've got to a long tongue. And I said, honey, you sure do. Go ahead and just lay it on the altar. <laughs> the bottom line is, is that many people who claim to know him do things that give evidence that there's a problem in their life. Jesus tells us that we're to watch what comes out of our mouth. We're to watch what we allow to come through our eyes. Uh, we're, we're to watch where we go and so forth. And so the bottom line is this. God's will for us is that with each passing day, we would become more like Jesus. So let me be clear about this. The day that I was saved, I did not get perfect, nor will I in the flesh. But I'm 
on the journey. I did get forgiven, but now I wear a sign around my neck that just says under construction because that's my life. And by the way, that's your life as well because you've not arrived either. I know that for a fact because I've already talked to some of you. <laughs> but we're under construction. God's doing a work in our lives. But I will tell you this. My passion and many, the passion of many of you is that with every day, Lord, help me today to be more like you than I was yesterday. And so that passion, that desire drives us. But do you have that passion? Do you have a desire to lay it on the line for Jesus and to, to allow him to build into your life the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, meekness, self-control, the fruit of the Spirit there that Galatians 5.22 talks about? Are those things being manifested in your life? Now, I want to tell you who can answer this question for you. You can answer the question, but I'm going to tell you somebody else who can give you a very objective answer. They're probably, in some cases, sitting right next to you. You see, my wife can tell you about me. You don't know me. You see me up here. You see me on Prophecy in the News. Maybe you've watched some of the DVDs or the other things, or YouTube, Facebook, whatever. But see, you don't really know me. She knows me. She knows my personal habits. She knows in the morning when I get up and get a cup of coffee and I get my Bible and I go to my private place there to get alone from God and get into the Word of God in order to allow the mind of Christ to get into me that morning when I get up before I mess up the day too much. My wife knows all about that. She knows the desires of my heart and your spouse knows yours. Your kids know what you do, moms and dads. And by the way, grandparents and grandparents, grandmothers and grandfathers, it's never too late to start to allow, to, for your grandchildren to know that you have a passionate desire to be like Jesus. But the question is, do you have the desire? And I'll tell you why I ask the question. Because only God gives the desire. You see, you'll never have the desire to be like Jesus unless the Holy Spirit of God manifests that in your heart and life. So let me ask you, do you have a passion to be more like Christ? Secondly, let me ask this simple question, and that is, when you're all alone, as I said a moment you know, that's who we really are when we're by ourselves. You're not who you are when you're sitting here looking pretty like you do today. It's when you're all by yourself and nobody's there, just you. When you're all alone, do you have a hunger for His Word? You know, the psalmist in Psalm 119.11 said, I have hidden thy word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You know, it's amazing today how many people will say that they're Christians, but they are totally ignorant, if I may use that bold and broad word, concerning the Word of God. They don't know anything about the Bible. And I'm not going to tell you something. When you know Him, you love this book. And I will tell you something. I don't care if you read it in the, the old-fashioned way like I do, or you read it on your blueberry or your blackberry or some other kind of fruit that you carry around. Or maybe Don Perkins was showing me last night, he's got a watch on his hand that can do everything under the sun, and, and you can read the scripture even on the watch. I don't care how you get it, but do you have a desire to get it, to get the word, to have the word saturate your heart, your mind, your soul, your life? Listen, it's having really the mind of Christ in you because that comes through the Word of God. And that's why Paul wrote to the Philippians in chapter 2, verse 6 and following when he said, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but rather humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death upon the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, both in heaven and upon earth and under the earth, and other, every tongue confess to the glory of God the Father. You can't have the mind of Christ apart from the Word of God because this is God's Word to His children. So, do you love the Word? Or are you like the guy I was talking to one day and sharing with him, and he said, oh, preacher, I've got a Bible. <laughs> he said, uh, I, I keep it laying right on my nightstand. My mother gave it to me. It's the St. James Version. You're a little slow on the uptake, but I understand. Well, for those of you who don't know, he was close. Because there is no St. James Version. There's a King James, all right? And I said to him, I said, well, it's pretty obvious that you're not very familiar with the Bible your mom left you because it's not St. James. It's King James. So here's the bottom line. If you pick up your Bible and it leaves a dust mark, it's going to tell us two things. Number one, you are a lousy housekeeper. 
And number two, you don't know this book very well. The truth is, God wants us to feast and feed upon His Word. Why? Because when we take up the shield of faith, when we put on the armor of God, according to Ephesians chapter 6, chapter, verses 10 and following, we do so that we can stand against the schemes, the fiery darts of the enemy who is always firing at us. The Bible says Satan roams to and fro as a lion, seeking whom he may devour. We, God does not want him preying on us, and our defense is the same defense that Jesus had in the wilderness when he was tempted, when Satan came to him and misquoted Scripture, and Jesus corrected that, but he could do it because he knew the Word of God. Today, biblical ignorance reigns to the degree that Pastors across the country, preachers can stand up and say things to people that are totally biblically incorrect and yet no one knows the difference. How tragic. At a time when we have more access to, to simple translations of scripture, more helps and so forth than any generation ever, yet this generation is the most biblically illiterate one since Jesus almost. So the question is, do you have a love for the Word of God? Thirdly, let me ask this question because my time is going to get away from me. <clears throat> Thirdly, when you're all by yourself, do you talk to Him in prayer? Now, let me remind you of something. You can't have a desire to be more like Christ unless the Holy Spirit of God gives it to you. You can't have a hunger for the Word of God unless the Holy Spirit gives it to you. You really won't have much of, a, of motivation to pray and to talk to God unless the Spirit of God gives it. And I'm not talking about the kind of prayer that says the, from the person who thinks that God is just their, their personal valet or butler who says, you know, can you get me a parking spot up front close to the mall entrance, you know, or whatever. No, I'm talking about praying. Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.17 that we're to pray without ceasing. Now, would it shock you to know that the believer's life is one that should be characterized by an ongoing conversation with God. Ongoing. It should never stop. Now, would you be shocked to know that you can be standing there in a the shower just buck naked and you can be praying? God's not shocked. He's seen that before. <laughs> he, he knows what you look like. He knows that you had everything you had 30 years ago. It's just three or four feet lower. He knows all that. <laughs> I can only say that to this group because the younger crowd doesn't understand. But they might get there someday. Having said that, we talk to him. Oh, why? Because Christ in you, the hope of glory. He lives in us. And therefore, he's never apart from us. Can, can I just share a kind of a pet peeve, one of those things? You know, do you have those things that just make you want to say, excuse me a minute, and you want to stick your finger down your throat and puke? Well, I, do, I want to do that every time I'm in a church when I hear some well-meaning brother or sister stand up and say this, Lord, we ask you to please be with us. I just want to scream and vomit at the same time. Why? It is an insult to the character of God to ask God to be with you because he said, I'll never leave you. Never will I ever forsake you. The bottom line is we don't ever have to, have to implore Him to be with us because He is never going to be apart from us. The only way He cannot be with you is if you don't know Him and you're separated from Him by your sin. And so to ask Him, what you're really saying is, I know you promised that you did, but I don't know if I really believe that or not. It's an insult to the character of God. So how many of you right now, in the presence of God and these assembled witnesses, will lift your hand and say, I promise I'll never pray that again. Huh? Will you do that? Put your hand there. Those of you live streaming, I can see you through that television set. Put your hand up. I'm never going to say that dumb prayer again. Rather, I'm going to thank Him that He will never leave us, that I can talk to Him on an ongoing basis, and that He hears me. There is no prayer that the Heavenly Father doesn't hear because we're His children. He loves us beyond our capability to even grasp that truth. And He's always, always with us. So when I'm driving down the road and I'm kind of moseying along there and this person whips out behind me and runs in front of me and gives me that, they wave at me only they don't use their whole hand. I can just say, Lord, thank you for that. 
I can talk, because I know you're here, you're watching over me, and, and you're always with me. So I simply ask these questions. One, when you're all by yourself, nobody's there, do you have a passion to be more like Christ? Do you have a love for the Word of God? Do you find yourself talking to Him regularly? If you can say, yes, yes, and yes, then based on the authority of the Word of God, I'm going to tell you that you know Him. More importantly, He knows you. Because, as I've said already, I'll say it again, that's the proof that the Spirit of God dwells within you. Because otherwise, it would never happen. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. All right. Then let's move on. I want you to remember this, and that is that Jesus did not come to save us in our sin. And let me clarify that. That means He did not come to save us so that we could stay like we are. He came to deliver us from our sin so that we would become different than we are. That is, we would be becoming, as I said again, more like Him. So, here's what I tell everyone. If you are what you were, then you ain't. <laughs> Simple as that. Now, I realize that they finally got wise and added ain't to the dictionary. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that when you come to know Christ, He changes you. He changes you. And the truth is today, we've got this kind of watered-down so-called gospel preaching today that says that you can just say, oh, I just love Jesus, and yet you can continue in your sin, and God's okay with that. Can I tell you that that is a de the deception of the devil, the enemy? Because God wouldn't tolerate your sin before, and He won't tolerate it now. The truth is, is that when He changes us, He expects us, while we are not going to be perfect in this lifetime, He expects us to choose to say no to the lustful desires of the flesh, to decide to purpose each and every morning when we get out, uh, get out of bed, that today I'm going to put on the blinders. I'm going to be careful of what I allow to come through my eyes, to what I allow to come through into my ears. I'm going to be careful about where my feet go. I am going to walk with Jesus today and I'm going to listen to the still small spirit of God as he speaks to my heart and I choose today, Lord Jesus, to not sin against you. It's a choice we make. I get so upset when I hear these folks say to me, oh, well, you know, we're just sinners saved by grace and, and we just can't help ourselves. Yes, you can. Why? Well, if that's true, then God's a liar. Because Jesus says, the Word of God teaches us, that the same power that brought Jesus Christ forth from the grave dwells now in us. And Paul tells us in Romans 8, verses 37 through 39, that we are more than conquerors, we're more than overcomers through the shed blood of the Lamb of God. We need to learn to walk in victory because we are victorious. We're not going to be, we already are. And this weak cop out about, well, I just can't help myself from sin. Yes, you can. Stop it. No, you're not going to do it. I am not going to indulge my flesh. But I did have peach cobbler and ice cream last night. <laughs> I could only do that because my wife wasn't here. But actually it was Don Perkins' fault. So here's the question. Are you different? Has he changed you? A man told me one time, he said, well, you know, God just loves me like I am. I don't have to be different. And I said, no, you can go ahead and die and go to hell because that's not true. You're lying to yourself. You know, there's a lot of deception in our world today, but the worst is self-deception. I recently heard Vicki Beeching, who's a, you know, a quote-unquote, and I use this term, not my word, theirs, Christian artist from London who came out and said, I'm a lesbian and God loves me just like I am. Well, first of all, I can, there's a little bit of truth in there. God loves her. But I'll tell you, God doesn't put up with your sin, my sin, or anybody else's sin. He calls us out from that. He died to deliver us from it. So, we ask the first question. Is it possible to think that you're saved and yet be lost? And the answer is yes. Billy Graham said that he's convinced that 90% he said this a number of years ago. He's convinced that 90% of the people sitting in the pews in the average church on Sunday morning have never been truly born again. Now, I want to tell you something. 
having traveled all over America, we're in a different place preaching every week. I can tell you that number is probably a smidgen low. Really, I'm serious. And I'll tell you why I say that. This is why I'm going to tell you why I say it. You see, you folks are a unique group. This is a Thursday. You're here listening to people talk about the Word of God. We can't get people in a church on Sunday morning. You go beyond 18, 20 minutes, they, won't, they, they just get in an uproar because you're preaching too long. Now, nobody seems to mind if they sing for 45 minutes and give 15, 20 minutes to the preaching of the Word. There are places that I go that I'm told that I have 18 minutes to preach. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I've started something new in the last few months because I can't take this anymore. And that is, is that I tell them, if I can't have 45 minutes to an hour, I'm not coming. Why? Because the truth is, you can cut out on some of the music. And by the way, I love music. Listen, I thank God for Christian music. I love wonderful music. I've got to just share this with you, though. Uh, uh, and I don't say this to offend the person that it happened with, but I turned around Sunday a week ago, two weeks ago, at a church, and I, and, and I just finished preaching, and I said, I just felt led to say, let's, before we leave, let's, let's sing something victorious. How about victory in Jesus? And the choir got, the, he, I don't know it. He said, you'll have to lead it. So I did. I mean, I did sound like a calf dying in a hailstorm, but nevertheless, I led the song. He didn't know it. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, and he'd never heard it. But my point is, cut back. Because you see, as much as God loves music, and He does, I mean, that's what the Jewish people did in the temple. God loves music. God gave us music. I love it. But i got to tell you something. God never said, music will accomplish the purpose for which it goes forth. It will not return to me void. But He said that about the Word of God. Amen. Further to that, He said, blessed are the feet that bring the Word of God. He said, how will they know if no one comes and brings the Word of God? So songs are wonderful, but when they start trumping the preaching of the Word of God by the man of God, something's terribly wrong. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. So the truth of the matter is, is that we know that we love Him because we want to be with Him. Question number two, will people be saved after the rapture? Well, the Bible tells us that the answer to that is, yes, they will. For example, Revelation 7 tells us in verse 4 and following that God is setting aside, will set aside 144,000 young Jewish evangelists. Now, not to be confused with Jehovah's Witnesses because, you know, their deal was there's only going to be 144,000 who go to heaven and then they had a big problem when they had 144,001 converts to uh, Jehovah's Witness, so now they got on the tier plan, you know. You're either executive platinum or you're a platinum or you're a gold or you're nothing <laughs> down here. But that's not how God works. But God does tell us specifically something about these Jewish people. These are, according to Revelation 14, young Jewish male virgins. Don Perkins and I were talking last night. Don was telling me about engaging a Jehovah Witness who she was a woman and she told him uh, she was one of the 144,000. And, of course, Don is such a sweet, incredible Guy, he looks at her and says, no, honey, you made a mistake because, uh, I mean, uh, you're not a man. And the Bible says it's young male Jewish virgins. And see, in heaven, they're not going to vote on whether or not we take husbands and wives, male and female, out of the vocabulary. It's coming here. They're already out there trying to get that. By the way, isn't it interesting? Let me just say something parenthetical for a moment, Okay. I'll step over here and say this. That in the homosexual community, even though they, there's this big hoopla today about getting rid of husband and wives and males and females, making everything kind of a transgender kind of a deal, that even in the homosexual community, do you know that in homosexual relationships, they always designate one as the husband, one as the wife? What's up with that? What are they going to do if, if, we, if they throw these, this terminology out? Okay, that doesn't have anything to do with my sermon. God is going to save these 144,000, seal them, he tells us, and send them in the world. Now, let me be clear about something. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, it says this, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world, and then the end will come. I want to tell you that that verse of Scripture is often misused. 
because in context, that's before and after, what's being spoken of is the tribulation period. And in the seven-year window after the signing of the peace covenant of Daniel 9, verse 24 through 27, that begins the seven-year, 2,520-day period known as the time of Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah 30, verse 7, that every believer will be gone. Every saved person. There'll be no one on the earth. None. But God is not going to leave the world without a witness. He's going to take these 144,000, save them, seal them, send them in the world, and every person that has been left behind on the globe. Now get this, every single person in seven years is going to hear the gospel that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Do you know why he's going to do that? It is because of that day that we spoke of earlier in Revelation chapter 20. Because no one is going to ever come before the throne of God and say, but God, I never heard. God, I never had a chance. You never gave me an opportunity. They are all going to hear. Now, we know that he's not just going to use the 144,000. He's going to use the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11. He's even in, in chapter 14 going to use a gospel angel. Now, some people say, well, now, is that like the angel, you know, network? And, and when, if God says he's going to use a gospel angel, listen, it's going to be an angel. Now, and, the, and I can tell you for sure, it's not going to be John Travolta. I can tell you that. I know that for a fact. <laughs> Having said that, when you couple 144,000 Jews who are on fire for God, preaching all over the globe, using every means available to them, and then you have two witnesses that are there in the old city of Jerusalem, there by the Wailing Wall, and they're preaching the uncompromising gospel of Jesus Christ for that first three and a half years of the tribulation period. And then you've got this gospel angel, whether they're flying in the air or not, because you see angels in the Bible really never have wings. The fact of the matter is God's going to use this person, this angelic being, to communicate the gospel of Jesus so that everyone hears them. The end result of that is going to be, in Revelation 7 verse 9, that an innumerable multitude of people are going to come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Are you still with me this morning? You're not bored, are you? Do you head like this? Say, no, I'm not. I'm with you. Okay, listen carefully. We've been given the Great Commission. Go into all the world. And to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. But here's the problem. We're not going to win the world to Jesus. We're not going to do it. Now, I just said about, I referenced earlier Matthew 7, verse 13. Broad is the road that leads to destruction. Most people go that way. Narrow is the road that leads to eternal life. Few there are that find it. The many versus the few. Jesus Christ knew that the majority of the world would never, ever surrender their will to His Lordship. But I will tell you this. We have an obligation and responsibility unto God to be obedient to the commander-in-chief, and that is to be salt and light in this world and to go into the world. And, I, and that world doesn't necessarily mean on the other side of the globe. It means that circle that you call your family, that broader circle that are your colleagues, people you might work with and so forth. You go into your world and you share the good news of Jesus Christ, and as a result of that, some of them will come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. That's the plan. But God is thinking outside the box. He's looking at the big picture, and His Word is going to go to everyone, and the net result is we're going to see the greatest soul harvest the world has ever seen after the church is gone, during the tribulation period. So harvest. That sounds like that ought to be the title of a book. I better run call Tim LaHaye and see if he and Jerry can... No, you, how many of you know there is a book in the 16-part series? Okay, some of you know that. All right. There is a book already by that title. But it was written all about that. So that passage in Revelation... I mean, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, is going to come to fruition after the church of Jesus Christ is gone. So the answer is, will people be saved at the rapture? Absolutely. So, third question and the most important. Who will be saved after the rapture? You see, that's really the right question to be asked. For a number of years, Dr. Tim LaHaye and Dr. Ed Heinsen and I traveled across the country doing what we called the Left Behind Conference on Bible Prophecy. And it was not uncommon to have someone come to us at a conference, if you can believe this, and they would say, for example, this happened at First Baptist in Church in Euless, Texas, which is a suburb of the Dallas metropolitan area. A man came at the end of, this, of the conference, and he said to me, he said, listen, uh, I came today because a friend invited me. He said, I want to tell you what my position is. 
You see, my position is, is that if I see all this stuff happen, like, you know, you preachers talk about, all these people are instantaneously missing and so forth and so on. He said, my position was, then I'll get saved. He said, but you know, because my friend invited me to this conference, he said, and as I've listened to you guys all day today, I've come to realize that's a real dumb plan. <laughs> and he said, so today I want to give my life to Christ now. Because you see, the truth is, for a person to take that position, and by the way, students are real bad about taking that position, younger people, college campuses and so forth, because it presumes or assumes that they're going to live to see that moment. And, and we have no guarantee. Our lives are but a vapor here one moment, gone the next. We have no guarantee we'll see tomorrow come up. So that said, the right question is, who'll be saved after the rapture? So I want to tell you my story, okay? Could you be up for that? Can I talk to you about that for a moment? Because I want you to hear God's equation for salvation. And every equation obviously has to have two parts. So here's the first part. It's found in John chapter 6, verse 44. I want you to get this. John tells us, Jesus rather, tells us, John records it, no one can come to me, Jesus said, unless or except the Father who sent me draws him. So I want you to hear me on this. This is what we would call biblical theology, okay? This is not complicated, but it's clear. You do not get to choose when you get saved. You ever thought about that? How do I know that? Because in Romans 7, verse 18, Paul tells us, he said, For I am persuaded that no good thing dwells in me that is in my flesh. You see, here's the problem. We're born into sin. And I can prove that. If you have a child, how many of you have a child, and you had to take your little boy, and you had to sit him down and say, Now, Johnny, let Daddy tell you how to tell a lie. I've got to teach you how to do this. <laughs> do you ever have to teach your kids how to do that? No. Did you ever have to take Susie, precious little Susie, and set her down and say, Honey, Mommy's going to teach you how to be selfish and self-centered. Did you ever have to do that? No, you didn't have to do that either. Why? Because it comes with the package. It's part of the deal. It's called the sin nature that was infused to us in the garden when Adam and Eve fell into sin. And the bottom line is, we are, and the, pain, the teaching of Scripture is, that we are totally depraved in and of ourselves. Therefore... God must do something to bring us to Himself. So when God created us, He created a place within us that He intended to dwell. That was going to be His dwelling place within us. And so what He does is He woos us, He draws us to Himself. If He doesn't draw you, you can't come, period. Because you see, in the flesh, we are so separated from God and so bound by sin that it would never cross our minds to turn to Him. So He does for us what we can't do for ourselves. Isn't that an incredible picture of the love of God, the compassion and mercy of the Lord Jesus? He draws us and He makes it clear, you can't come to me unless the Father draws you. So that's part one of the equation of salvation. We're talking about the equation of salvation. All right, so part number two, and this is the good part. Second Peter chapter 3, the Lord is not slow. Some Bibles translate it slack and others forgetful. In keeping His promises, some understand it's slowness, but He is patient with you not wanting, key word, look at it, I highlighted the word, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So here's the deal. You can't come to Him unless He draws you, but because He loves you and because He wants everyone to be saved, He draws every person. How do I know that? Because He tells us He doesn't want anyone to perish. That's an inclusive term. He wants everyone, another inclusive term, to come to Him in repentance. Therefore, listen carefully. Are you listening? Do your head like this. I'm listening. Are you sure you're listening? Do you hand, take your finger and do it like this. Make sure your ears are not dirty. I want you to hear this. Therefore, if God doesn't draw a person, God can't judge them at the judgment seat of Christ. Think about it. The righteous, holy God, how could He judge a person for their sin if in fact He never called them in order to deliver them from their sin? The justice and the righteousness, the mercy, the holiness of God demands that every person get called. 
So here's the question. If everybody's going to be called, then the question is, how and when does he call them? Well, this is where it gets kind of interesting. I want to tell you my story. It was a Sunday night, and I was seated on the back row of the Miller Road Baptist Church in Garland, Texas, and a guy by the name of Jack Howells was preaching. I don't know if you ever heard that name or not, but he was up there preaching. Now, the way I got there was that one year prior to that, roughly, when I was but five years old, my dad, who was a truck driver for Safeway Food Stores, they relocated their warehouse facility from Dallas out to the east of town to a suburb called Garland, Texas. And so my parents bought the, uh, their first home. And it was a little cracker box, two bedroom, one bath, little house on a neighbor street, just, you know, all those cookie cutter houses along there, all young families trying to make it, you know, and so forth. And this was about 1954. And so, so anyway, we move into this house. Well, little, little did I know that something strange began to happen. All of a sudden, we would be playing, my older brother and I at that time, and my mother would come through flipping the lights out and she'd make us sit down in the back bedroom and be quiet. And in a few minutes, what would happen is there'd be this knock on the door. And then they'd knock again. And then after a minute, they'd go away. Well, then my mother would get up and turn the lights on. We'd go back doing what we were doing. I, I had no idea what was going on. Well, my mother later told me what was happening. She said, these crazy people from the Miller Road Baptist Church <clears throat> were out in the neighborhood knocking on doors, talking to people about Jesus. And uh, she said, I didn't want anything to do with them. They're a bunch of nuts. But one Tuesday night when my mother went to flip the porch light off, there was this face of this angel there looking at her. And my mother said, I couldn't turn the light off in her face. So I opened the door and this is what I said to her. She said, I looked at her straight, straight in the face and I said, we know who you are. We know what you want. I want to tell you, we don't care about your God. We're not interested in your church. Just leave us alone. She said, you know what that woman said to me? She said, she looked at me straight in the face. She said, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. Now, most people would have turned around and took off, wouldn't they? Not this little bandy rooster, not her. <laughs> she said, I'll make you a deal. You come to church one time just this Sunday and I'll promise you nobody from Miller Road Baptist Church will ever knock on your door again. Well, at that point, my mother, as she shared this in her testimony, said, I would have done anything to get rid of those pesky people. <laughs> and so that Sunday rolled around. My mother was a woman of her word. She got up. She got her only dress, and she put it on, her nice dress, and she went to church. And I will tell you something. My mother left one way. She came home another way. Because my mother in her, tells the story that that morning, for the very first time in her life, she heard how she, a sinner could separated from God by her sin, could be reconciled to a holy God through a person, the personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And when the pastor at the end of that service said, I want to invite you to trust Christ, come down this aisle, she said, I didn't walk, I ran so much so. She said, I jumped out of that seat and hung the, my dress on the bottom of the chair and ripped a portion of the bottom off, but I didn't care. She said, I gave my life to Jesus that day. Well, I got news for you, my life changed dramatically. I'm five years old. And all of a sudden, I'm like the $1 bill, the $10 bill, the $20 bill, and the bank bag. You know that story, don't you? Well, the $20 bill said, man, it's been a great week. We've been to some really nice restaurants, been to the movie a couple of times. $10 bill spoke up and said, well, it hasn't been that great a week for us. We've been to McDonald's a couple of times. And it's been pretty good. The dollar bill spoke up and said, said well, y'all have had it better for, than me. For me, it's just been the same old, same old church, church, church. I usually like to tell that just before the offering plate gets passed. <laughs> I'm in church every time the doors are open. It's Sunday morning for Sunday school. It's Sunday morning for worship. It's Sunday night. Now, I'm going to look around this room, and some of you can relate to this. Do you ever hear something called training union? Huh? Well, Sunday night was training union. Now, training union would go up there, and, of course, we learned about the Bible and so forth. And then Sunday night service. And then there was Wednesday night preaching, if you can believe that. On a Wednesday night, people actually came to church. Do you know that in Garland, Texas, in those years, that school teachers did not give homework on Wednesday because it was church night? Do you know that on Wednesday, there was no such thing as baseball practice or football practice or anything else because it was church night? Do you know that there were 28,000 people living in Garland at that time and 7,000 of them were members of Miller Road Baptist Church? <laughs> you, think that, you think you can impact 
the world. I wish I had time to tell you about some exciting things that are on track for 2016. I hope I get a chance to do that because we're going to change America in November of 2016. That's not a political statement. That's a fact. And you're going to be a part of that. You're going to help change it. You're going to be one of those 28 million Christians that didn't go vote. I don't care who you vote for, but you're going to vote for somebody because it's the right thing to do. Amen? Amen. And so you want to be a part of that. <clears throat> so you're going to go to a website called unitedinpurpose.com. Unitedinpurpose.com, and you're going to see the role that you can play in bringing America back to God, to bring for America to come home again. Back on the, what I was sharing with you, though, and that is simply this. I was there every time the doors were open. So a year passes. It's now Sunday night. I'm sitting on the back row, and the preacher's preaching, and I am not paying attention. In fact, in the old days, how many of you remember hymn books? You remember hymn books? We used to have hymn Before we had all this fancy technology, we had hymn books. So I've got a hymn book back there, and I'm writing in the hymn book. Here I am, six years old, defacing God's property. I'm, property, I'm already a criminal at six. Now, I was careful about what I was doing because my mother was in the choir. She was seated up here on the corner. And my mother had, in her time, had never heard a doctor, uh, what's his name, Spook? I mean, not Spook, uh, Spock, Spock, that's what he is. He is a Spook, but Dr. Spock. And uh, I knew that if my mother saw me, she'd get up, come right out of the choir, she'd come right around, grab me up, tear up my landing gear right in front of God and everybody. You see, that was a different time. There was no such thing as, the inmates were not running the prison in those days. You know, and, the, and parents actually used to spank children. Can you believe that? I mean, they actually took that thing that God gave, that God gave all of us and they used the rod of correction in a spirit of love. Today you do that, you go to jail. Of course, you know that already. Having said that, I'm very covertly doing this, hoping she doesn't see me. But all of a sudden, the strangest thing happened. I felt like Samuel the night that he was laying there in the house of the priest and all of a sudden he heard his name being called Samuel. Gary began to, God began to call my name, Gary. Now, I didn't hear anything audible, you understand? But there was something right here, and I want to tell you, when God calls your name, you'll know it. He has a very, very distinct voice. And that night, he began to call my name. So much so that I put the hymn book down, and I zeroed in on what was being said. A few minutes later, the preacher said, if God has spoken to you tonight, if God's called you to himself tonight, I want you to get up out of your seat and come stand with me right here. And I want to pray for you. Now, I'm six years old. You say, six years old. How is a six-year-old, how, how can a six-year-old even know, trust me, when God calls you, you'll know it. So I leaned down, I looked down that aisle, and just to be honest with you, it looked like it was 500 miles down there. <laughs> but I remember it as though it were yesterday. I got up out of my seat. I walked all the way down there. He was a tall guy. Of course, when you're six years old, everybody's tall. And he reached down when I walked up to him. He took my hand. He said, son, why are you coming? I said, well, I'm coming because I want to give my life to Jesus. And if he wants it, he can have my baseball glove as well. <laughs> well, my baseball glove was some, like some of you guys in here. That was my most prized possession. I took my baseball glove to school. I was never without it. And I guess in my six-year-old little mind, I was really saying, I want to give Jesus all of me and this is everything I have. Well, I'm going to tell you something. That night, I didn't know anything about the JDEP documentary hypothesis of the authorship of the Pentateuch. <laughs> I know that you probably know what I'm talking about. Could write a paper on it, couldn't you? Sure you could. I didn't know anything about sanctification, glorification, regeneration. I, I didn't know any of that stuff. But this is what I knew. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And that night, the most incredible thing happened to a six-year-old little boy. The God who spoke the world, the same God who spoke the world into creation, stepped right out of heaven and right into the life of a six-year-old little boy. And I'm going to tell you something. I have stumbled and fallen and messed up over the years, done things that I'd be so embarrassed and humiliated if you knew about. But I'm going to tell you something. That night, God changed me. That night, Jesus came to live within me. I'm going to tell you something that I don't understand today. My mother and dad, <clears throat> my dad wasn't a believer at that point in time yet, but later he would become a believer. But my mother never had to come to me on a Sunday morning and threaten me to get out of bed and get ready to go to church or she's going to take away some toy or whatever. They never had to do that with me. Because I want to tell you something, when I met Jesus, he put a hunger in me 
to know the Word of God. I loved going to church. Church was the place where I was taught about Jesus. I loved those things on Sunday evenings that we used to have called Bible drills. Man, you'd go in there and you'd present your sword and they'd give you a verse of Scripture and the first person there got a prize. And listen, I was all over those prizes. People say to me, you know, Brother Gary, you, you, you just seem to know a lot. You just seem to have memorized a lot of Scripture. I have. You know what? I still practice memorizing today, but I'm going to tell you something. 90% of the Scripture that God has buried up here, I learned before I was about 20 years old. As a child, I learned to hide the Word of God in my heart. And I will tell you that that was an incredibly exciting time. I love to go to church. You see, I didn't complain about the preacher preaching too long. And I didn't complain about the music. I just loved being there because that's where I was taught about Jesus. I want to tell you something. Something is very wrong when parents have to go to their children today and threaten to take away their, their iPhone or whatever it is in order to get them to go to church. You see, the truth of the matter is, moms and dads and grandmothers and granddads, we need to be parents and grandparents, and we need to say, this is the way it is. You're getting out of bed, and if you don't, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> I mean, hey, let's quit letting them tell us what they're going to do. God gave us as parents because they don't know what's best for them, and we do. It's not that don't do as I do, do as I say do. Model Jesus before them, but there's something very wrong with that. So this is a picture of me sitting in a Sunday school class. You know what happened? In that class, there's a godly young man right there with a white towel. Let me tell you what that man did on Tuesday nights. On Tuesday evenings, we'd go to church because it was visitation night. Now, I got to tell you, there was a hook there. The hook was, is that we had a place called Lindy's Drive-In. And I'm going to tell you, they made the best hamburgers in the world, at least in my six-year-old mind. And they used to get, have free hamburgers at church on Tuesday night before we went out visiting. I never missed a Tuesday night. Because, you know, our idea of getting to eat out was a hot dog at a ball game or something like that. So I went on Tuesday nights, and that man took me and another one of these boys in that class, and we'd go to the homes of other little boys and talk to them about coming to church and about knowing Jesus. I learned from a very early age how to have a passion for other people, how to share my faith, and how, to, how important it is that we share the good news of Jesus unashamedly because God loves everyone. Well, the fact of the matter is, is that when I was 12 years old, God called me to preach. The years went by, <clears throat> and, the, and uh, as I said to you a moment ago, I messed up royally, but God was always faithful. Because God called me that Sunday night, and I responded appropriately. So hear me. When God calls us, He expects us to respond. He writes in Hebrews, do not harden your hearts <clears throat> as those in the wilderness, etc. The Bible tells us that today is the day of salvation. So when God stirs a person's heart, He expects them to come to Him. Now, we don't know how many times or how many opportunities a person may have. We don't know if God calls a person one time, five times, ten times. We don't have any knowledge of that. We know that God gave Pharaoh five opportunities to do the right thing. Remember what it says of Pharaoh? Five times it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart and would not let the people go. But starting with the sixth time, it says, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now let me tell you an experience about this and when this came home to me. I, have, I was pastoring in the city of New Orleans at the time and had a member of our church who was in the hospital. And so that Sunday morning, I jumped up early, went down to the hospital to see him before the worship service. And when I walked into the room, uh, I told him, I said, listen, I heard the news and, I, I, you know, things are not looking good. And I said, I just felt led to come this one last time to talk to you about your relationship with Jesus Christ. And he said, oh, preacher, listen, you know, I, I appreciate you coming, but, but I'm really just not interested in that. Now, <clears throat> let me say this. He was from a religious background that never taught that you could actually know Jesus Christ personally. It was all about doing good things and trying to be a good person, hoping that you did more good things than you do bad things, which is a terrible way to live, a worse way to die. So I looked at him and I said, listen, you don't understand, you're going to die. He said, oh, that's okay. No, I'm just not concerned about it. Well, as a young preacher, I'm standing there thinking, you know, if I didn't know for certain that I was going to go to heaven, I, I'd say, oh, anything you offer, I'll take. I mean, I'd try to hedge my bet any way I could. But he wasn't. He wasn't interested. 
And that really kind of blew me away. I prayed with him. I went back to my office later that day. And I just sometimes, as my practice was, I used to just get on my knees and I have the Bible in my hand. And sometimes I just open a passage of Scripture and just read it. And God led me to Matthew 12, verse 31 and following, where it says, it speaks about rejecting the, the Holy Spirit of God. You would know the passage as what we call the unpardonable sin. And that is you can reject Jesus, but when you say no to the Holy Spirit, there's nowhere else to go. And what happens is there is a line drawn in the sands of time, a line that you and I can't see. We don't know where it is. But God calls and God calls, whether it's through a song, a sermon, or maybe somebody leaves a gospel track somewhere, whatever the case may be. And God calls a person and they say no, and they say no, and they say no. And finally one day, they cross that line without even knowing it, and God no longer calls them. They have said no for the last time. Now, I know that's a reality, and I want to tell you why. Because as I travel across America and preach in churches, I see the power of God move in, in incredible ways. And yet I see people in rooms and auditoriums across this country who are totally untouched by the moving of the power of God. The only thought on their mind is, when is this guy going to quit so that I can get to the cafeteria and eat lunch? They're not interested in whether or not people come to saving faith in Christ. They don't think that they're just doing their religious duty. I'm going to tell you something. They have crossed the line. They've committed the unpardonable sin. Because I'm going to tell you something. God will withdraw himself when a person says no long enough. Make no mistake about it. There are deadlines in life. One is death, of course. The other is a rapture. But the other one is when you say no one time too many. And that's why when God stirs your heart as a believer, he wants you to share with some, there's somebody nearby who he's working on and he wants you to be available to him to share a good word. Fact of the matter is, is that I'm convinced that many people today have crossed the line. They're still naming the name of Jesus. But they've made their eternal destiny. That destination has already been set because they've rejected him. So listen to this, and I'm done. You still with me? Say amen. amen. I appreciate you so much sitting all this while. But listen to this. The question is always, well, what about the people who have heard, you know, and the rapture occurs? Are they going to be saved? They have a second chance, quote, unquote. Well, I'm going the wrong way here. Let me change this. The Defender Study Bible who is, was authored by one of the saints that have gone home to be with the Lord. That is the notes in it, Dr. Henry Morris. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10 and 12, Henry Morris would write these notes, and here's what he says. Those who refuse the truth that is Christ, before the rapture, will perish under the rule of the man of sin. There will be no second chance after the rapture for any who understood but rejected the gospel before the return of Christ. It's therefore desperately urgent for all people, especially Americans who have had every opportunity to receive Christ, to believe on Christ for salvation before He returns. Those who do not believe the truth of the glorious gospel of Christ when they have the opportunity in this age, rejecting Him as Creator and Savior, are destined to damnation, that is eternal punishment in the lake of fire. There will be no opportunity for them to be saved in the tribulation period for their names will have been blotted out of the book of life. Now listen carefully. Traveling across the country with Tim LaHaye, as I said, and those of you, some of you have read the Left Behind books, you know that in that book, people heard the gospel, and then later in the tribulation, they came to saving faith in Christ. I do not share that view. I believe, and Paul says in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter uh, 2, Verses 10 11, for this reason God shall send upon them such a strong delusion so as to believe the lie, for they refuse to receive the truth in order that they might be saved. I believe that God wants you to be saved when He draws you, and when you don't, you then will have that delusion. There will not be a further opportunity. So this and I'm done. If I'm right, and I'm going to say that I could be wrong, although I doubt it. I have a real Holy Ghost conviction about this. If I'm right, it means that just like those people who were sitting in the video, when Christ came, they were left behind. They had no second chance. They will be deceived by the enemy. The same thing will happen in churches across America. The same thing happen, can happen even here today. You may be sitting in this room today, and you may not know that you know that you know him. They may be a stirring in your heart today. I know you're at a prophecy conference on Thursday. I understand that. But that ain't going to get you to heaven. 
bottom line is God may be speaking to you today, right where you are. He may be calling you. Because you see, you don't know what happens when you get up and walk out of this room. You don't know. We're but a heartbeat from eternity. And so I'm asking you today, is God speaking to someone in this room? You say, well, <laughs> preacher, I, why would I be in a prophecy? I understand all that. I understand. Remember what they said to Jesus? Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons? Did we? I'm just saying, you might be in this room. You may be watching us on live streaming. I don't know what you're back. I don't know what you know. But I'm going to tell you that what I've shared with you today is the truth of the Word of God. And so I'm going to ask you to bow your head right now, whether you're with us here in present or whether you're watching by live streaming. And I want you to, to answer this question. Do you know that you know today without any question, without any anxiety, without any ambiguity that if Christ came or you were to die, you'd go to heaven? Do you know that? If you don't know that, then I want you to pray a prayer with me today only, only if there's a stirring in your heart. If, there's, if God is wooing you, if He's calling you, if He's stirring your heart right now, I want you to pray this prayer with me. It's a very simple prayer. And in this prayer, here's what you're going to do. You're going to transfer the trust that you may have in your good works or who you are or what you've done. You're going to put all of that onto Jesus and you're going to become very clear today that it is Christ alone. That You can't add one thing to what Jesus did on the cross. He paid it all and He loves you and He is willing to wash the slate clean. The 103rd Psalm says that God will take your sin and put it as far as the east is to the west, never again to be remembered. God will drop it into the sea of forgetfulness if you'll let Him. But you've got to let him come into your life and, ch and you've got to be willing to allow him to change you. So if that would be your desire, you just pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your own heart. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I know I cannot save myself. And so right now as an act of my own free will, I ask you to forgive me of my sin, to come into my life, to save me, to change me, and to give me the courage every day to live for you. And I want to thank you for doing that. In the name of Jesus. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Did you pray that prayer, anyone in this room? No one is looking, just me. Every head bowed, every... If you prayed that prayer, I want you to slip your hand up just so I can see it. I'm not going to embarrass you. Just hold it up for a moment. God bless you. God bless you. Yes, yes, yes. As I look around the room, yes, sir, I see that hand over there. Yes, I, I see it over there. God bless you. I'm going to challenge you right now to do something. This may shock you that I would do this, but I'm led of the Lord to do it. I'm going to step down here, just like my pastor did when I was six years old, and I'm going to ask you where you were seated, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, I'm going to ask you to do something that will take courage. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come stand right here with me. Why? Because I want to pray for you. And I want to say this before you come. All of life's important decisions are public ones, and Jesus said, do not be ashamed of me. So if you prayed that prayer and you really meant it, you do what this gentleman is, you come stand right here with me right now so that I can pray for you. That's all I'm going to do. I just want to pray for you. Come on, come quickly. You say, well, why can't we stand up and make it easier? Because it wasn't easy for Jesus to carry that cross to die upon it. You can get up, climb over people. They'll let you out. You come stand right here with me and I want to pray for you because I want you forever to settle this issue that you belong to Him, He belongs to you and that nothing can ever separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Guys, I'm going to ask you to step over here. I want, you, I want us all together in one group here because I'm going to try to hug as many of you as I can. So get up here close. I took a shower and put some deodorant on. And I don't think I smell bad. So get up here real close. So we're going to pray. Come on up. We're going to wait. Anybody else? You're coming. You're saying, I, I'm, I want to settle this issue once and for all, forever. Never again will I allow the enemy to deceive me or to cause me anxiety or concern. I know that I know that I know him. Anybody else before I pray? All right, those of you in the congregation, I want you to pray with us as well, okay? Heads bowed, eyes closed. I want to pray for these folks. Now, guys and ladies, before I pray for you, one thing real important. Remember this. The devil hates you. He'll try to lie to you. He'll accuse you. He's the accuser of the brethren. You need to know that no matter what he comes to you and brings up about your past, that it is under the blood. When Satan accuses you of doing something you did yesterday or last week or last month, listen to this. From this moment on, God has no recollection of that. So when the devil speaks to you, you say to him, listen, you remind him that he's going to hell and you're going to heaven. 
And he has no authority in your life from this moment on, okay? From now on, you belong to Jesus. You're God, a God's kid, okay? Everybody understand that? All right, then let me pray for us. Father, in the name that is above every name, we just love you today. Lord, we, are, we stand in awe of your incredible grace and mercy that would bring these precious ones as you would draw them to yourself. Lord, we just are so excited, we're so thankful, so grateful that the gospel is going out and that people are coming to saving faith in Christ and it's all about you. And we just exalt the name of Jesus today for your glory. Now, speak to these precious ones. Thank you for saving them, for washing them clean now before you they stand as the blood-bought child of God, part of your forever family, a God's kid. And so just fill them with your presence. Put your words in their mouth. Give them a passion to be more like you and a hunger for the Word of God. And Lord, until you come again to take us to be with you, may you use them in an incredible way to bring honor and glory to you as you change their lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Now, now folks, don't go anywhere. Stay right here a minute. The reason we're clapping is because there's a great big party going on in heaven right now. Okay? And they're having a good time. So what I want to say to each and every one of you, on my book table there's a book called The Divine Appointment. And I want to give that book to you as a gift so that you can understand that today you had a divine appointment. You didn't come here by accident. God brought you here. God brought me here to put us together to transact the business of God. We've done that business. Go by and tell my table that you're to get that free book called The Divine Appointment. Okay? God bless you. You can go back to your seat. Are you glad you came this morning? Yeah. Well, that was a little weak. I said, are you glad you came this morning? Yeah. Get on your feet. Get on your feet and let's give him a praise offering. Just rejoicing in, in the Lord and his goodness to each and every one of us. And by the way, and by the way, and by the way, if you... If you are saved, then you ought to be just, God just probably in your mind a moment ago took you back to the time that you came to know Him and you should have just been saying, thank you Jesus, not just for them, but for saving me, a sinner saved by the grace of God. Well, I'm glad you were here because if you were not, I wouldn't have anybody to preach to, like I said earlier. <laughs> it is time, believe this or not, for lunch. And so we've had some spiritual food, and now we're going to have some physical food. I want to say a word about our, all of our speakers in the hallway. You see all those tables out there. Let me tell you that we unashamedly ask you, as the Lord leads, to purchase materials from us. Why? Because first of all, we think they're good. All right, because each of us, we've written books, we produce DVD series. I have one I'm just going to mention to you. We just filmed, after my 189th trip to Israel, we just filmed a, a Holy Land trip called Walking Where Jesus Walked. It's six and a half hours. I want you to know that. But it is a Holy Land tour exactly like the one we do with all the groups that go through our ministry to Israel. And I did it because people kept saying, Gary, you need to do something for the people that either physically or financially, are never going to get to walk where Jesus walked. And so last July, in the middle of the hot times in Israel, I took a cameraman, and we actually did a Holy Land tour. So if you've never been to Israel and you've always wanted to go, you can get that. By the way, Prophecy in the News is hosting a trip to Israel. And if you'd like to be a part of that, it's being promoted in the magazine, it's on our website and so forth. Um, and you can do that as well. And if you're thinking about doing that, or even if you've been to Israel before, It'll be a refreshing time. I did all the history, all the devotionals, the biblical application, and so forth and so on. It's all out there for you. That's on our table. But all of these products and materials are good. And when you buy those, let me be clear, you help us stay on the road doing what we're doing. Because all of these men are men who are, I, I can't speak for every single one of them. I don't, I've, a lot of them I haven't heard preach. I don't know if they're any good or not. <laughs> but I have a sneaking suspicion that they weren't, they were not good, they wouldn't be here. But having said that, uh, you help all of us continue to do what we, and we are so grateful to you. And just know this, you may not go into every church that I go into. You can't do that. But when you purchase materials, you help me spread the gospel. And you have a part of every person that comes to faith in Christ. Because without you, without the body, we couldn't do what we do. So God bless you for being here today. 
and thank you so much. You are going to have an awesome time the rest of today and Friday and Saturday. And again, please understand how grateful Linda Church, Linda Kay, all the team at Prophecy in the News, Dr. Kevin Clarkson, and of course, me as well. We are so thankful that you're here. God bless you. You are dismissed for lunch. See you back in here at 1 o'clock.